What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to another edition of Define Your Legacy. I'm your host, Theus Elijah McBee. All right, before we tap into this week's episode, just want to shout out the online store for Define Your Legacy, all right? And that can be found at the link in the episode's description, all right? We have t-shirts, long sleeves, sweatshirts, masks, mugs, all that can be found at the link in the description of this episode for the Define Your Legacy online store. All right, now, with that being said, we can hop right into this week's episode. We have Brittany on the show. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Thanks so much for asking. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's an honor to have you on the show. Um, if you could um, just introduce yourself and just tell us your story and everything that you do um, right now and just your overall journey to, to where you are. Sure. I'm Brittany. Um, I am a um, professional resume writer and career consultant. I'm also a mother. I'm also a wife. Um, I'm also a DEI strategist for a global tech company. So um, I have a passion for workforce development. I have a passion for ensuring that folks who are underrepresented receive both the skills, training, and resources to get into the competitive market and earn salaries that allow them to um, essentially take care of their families in ways um, that either they couldn't before or in ways that they have not yet conceptualized. Um, so I kind of got started in this vision and journey by being a single parent. So I went through a divorce and I was a single parent. And through that experience, I really saw there are so many resources that are just not given to Black women. There are so many uh, mentorship opportunities that we get overlooked for. And ultimately, there's really no one who kind of stands in the gap to recognize the dual minority status that Black women hold and begin to bridge that gap to ensure that we're able to take care of ourselves, take care of our children, as well as have abundance. And so for me, um, on that journey. I was in a call center, transitioned over to HR, served as a project manager, managed all of our workforce development internally, which was like training, learning and development, upskilling folks who were coming in in the entry level role. And then from there, went over to do workforce development for our city and then DEI work for the city of Philadelphia. So School District of Philadelphia and now on the global scale. But through that journey, I never forgot my experience as a single mother. And I never forgot what it was like having my car repossessed. And I never forgot what it was like figuring out, you know, if I'm going to pay daycare first or if I'm going to pay rent first. And so those experiences really guide my um, good volunteerism and the the folks that I want to help, as well as guide who I am as a woman and a business owner, because even though I'm where I am now, which is remarried and, you know, I have a set of twins and my children are well and they have savings accounts and um, 529 accounts for college, the reality is that I didn't start there and I didn't come from a family who had that. So I had to create that vision for myself. And that's what I do for my clients. I put them in positions to create a version of their family that maybe they did not have when they were growing up. Okay. Okay. And, and there's a lot to unpack in there. There's a lot that I want to touch on in that story, which is, uh, you know, I think a good and dope thing. Um, so what made you want to help people? You know, cause I think, you know, you, I think you stated that you realized that there was a problem, but what, you know, because a lot of people could just realize that and then just say, all right, I need to get everything right with myself, but you made the decision to actually help people. So how'd you come about doing that? recognizing that the person who helped me didn't look like me. So the person who really championed and advocated for me and used their privilege was a white woman. It was a white woman who was just like, hey, hey, you're smart. You don't have to stay in a call center. The company has this perk. We'll pay for your master's as long as you stay and use your master's. And so they transitioned me to HR. But what I recognize is that as much as she used her privilege to support my professional development, there were just some things about me that she just didn't understand because culturally we were different. And so I recognize that um, there just wasn't a lot of support for Black women. And so I really wanted to recognize that, hey, I now have this privilege and that I'm in this protected space to get more people who look like me here. And so what can I do to get them here? Um, and it started out with just looking at the resumes of the people who were applying and fixing those resumes before I sent it over to the hiring managers. And then ultimately ended up becoming, you know, helping different friends I went to grad school with and then them recommending me to other people. Um, my target audience was and always has been like black women. And so I kind of just kept 
kept working with different Black women. And honestly, it was a hustle before it was a business, right? Like in full transparency, I didn't even charge people at first. And then when I did start charging people, it was like $50. And I remember I was only charging people because I wanted to buy my kids a passport. So I was like, once I, you know, get my kids passports, I don't even have to write resumes anymore. And I didn't. I bought my kids passports. Then I realized I got these passports and won't even have nowhere to go. So I started resume writing again. So I kind of really like hustled to get the money up to take my kids on an international trip. But again, ultimately, it always was to, to support Black women. Um, but my model to start was really just hustling to meet certain financial goals. And, w- and when did you realize, though, that this was something that you could like legitimately help people with? Um, so it's 2022. I would say 2019 um, was big for me because I think that was when like the first year that like I actually like had a real business, like a website and everything. Um, that was the year where like I finally was like, okay, I should actually charge people market value. And I still was below value then. Um, I would say my business really took off in terms of recognizing my impact last maybe 2020, it was really when I was able to, the pandemic, yeah. um, so many people got laid off and I was able to not only support black women with getting new resumes to get them back into the workforce. I also started like sending diapers and wipes to women mm-hmm. um, because there's tons of public assistance, but I remember being a single mom and like, of course you got WIC if you want formula, there's, you know, food if you need food, there's housing, there's all of these programs. But like, if I didn't have diapers, I just didn't have diapers. Um, And so I started sending diapers and wipes because I recognized that like, hey, there's this need that public assistance doesn't do. And it's just amazing how God works because like through that, so many people started saying like, hey, I want to work with you for my resume because I see you really have a passion for Black women. Yeah, yeah. And and, and you, you know, heavy on, you know, the support of Black women, which you know, representation really does matter, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think the, the delivery of who the message is coming from um, is extremely important. Um, but in terms of your, your clients, what's one thing that you feel um, that you've been able to establish a connection with, right? In addition to um, both being Black women or just underrepresented? Yeah, um, so I would say folks connect to me because I'm really honest, not only about where I am, but also where I've been. Um, So I love nice stuff, okay? Like, let's just call it what it is. I love a nice bag. I love, bought my first Chanel in 2021. And so being able to say like, I do take my family on an annual trip. I do drive a BMW. I do wear nice bags. And five or six years ago, I was a single mom and I was on every public assistance available and I got a repossession and I went through a divorce and like, my whole life has changed in just six years. And so I find that my clients appreciate that I can be honest that like I've not had and I have. And the idea that honestly, I could lose everything again and I would be really, really confident that I could get it back. I think my clients need to hear that. And so I'm really honest that like, I really did get it out the mud. I really did come from um, not a lot of money, you know, my mom had me as a teenager and then I had my first son at 20 and it took me six years to get out of undergrad. And so being really honest about that and, um, not acting like I always had it. I think that's very powerful for people to know. Hmm. When your car got repossessed, if you don't mind me asking yeah, some of the thoughts that were going through your mind. Oh my goodness. Let me be honest. And I know most people are not going to say this. I was so relieved. Okay. And the reason I was relieved because they were blowing my phone up. Okay. Like all the time calling me, calling me, calling me about this car. And then the anxiousness of like waking up. And the first thing I have to do is check is my car there. Okay. My car is there. Let me get myself ready. Let me get my baby ready for school. Let me drive my child to school. Let me drive to work. And it's like, are they going to come to my job and repossess my car? Like, the anxiousness of not knowing when your car is going to be repossessed is like, it's an anxiousness that like, you can't sleep. You got to wait. Cause I had to wake up early enough so that if I did have to catch the bus, cause this was before like Uber was really popping. Yeah. If I did have to catch the bus, I had enough time to catch the bus, get my son to daycare and still get on the bus back to work. Mm. It was more stressful trying to navigate knowing my car was about to get repossessed then it was knowing, all right, cool. I got to get my bus pass on Sunday. I take my son to daycare. And then after that, I roll. Like the anxiety of knowing your car is on the repossession list is crazy. It's a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. Like you just never know where you're going to be. 
Yeah, but you know what though? That's a sign, you know, like the strength of, of black moms is like, you're gonna make it work, right? You're, you're gonna find a way to, you know what I'm saying, get through it. Um, but even in saying that though, right? Do, do you feel like that moment for you was more motivating or sad? Like looking back on it now, do you think you're more motivated or, or, or hurt by it? I, I don't think that I was hurt by it because I didn't really understand the gravity at that moment, right? Like I didn't, when you're like, when you're in deep poverty like that, like I'm talking about like on food stands in a one bedroom apartment with a baby fighting with my ex about child support. Like when you're knee deep in poverty like that, I don't even think you really can understand the implications of what you're experiencing because it's like, okay, cool, no car. I still got to go to work because I'm hourly. I'm not salary. Um, and so I don't know if it was motivating or um, defeating. I think when you're in that level of poverty, and we know that poverty is a form of trauma now, but when you're in that level of poverty, you can't really feel um, you really just have to like roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. I think recently I was able to understand the gravity of it um, because I took my car, this was maybe like a couple of, in November, I took my car to my BMW dealer and my um, dealer said, wow, like you haven't put really any miles on your car in the last two years. Can we buy your car back? And I was like, okay you know they're like we'll put you in a 2022 like we'll take care of it you know we'll give you we'll pay out your note and we'll give you like another 10k towards you know whatever you want right and so for me as a business owner and for where i am in my career like i make decent money and i'm like cool i got it pick my car and everything and when they ran my credit i could not get a car and it didn't matter how much money I had in the bank. They wanted me to put down approximately 20K. Like, I'm not giving you $20,000. Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I was able to really understand the gravity. I was able to um, deal with the shame of a repossession. I was also able to deal with the fact that um, I, I didn't really need my credit back then because it was like, girl, you in a one bedroom apartment. Like, you know, your credit don't even matter for where you at. But when you get to a certain place in life where you you can afford nicer things and you want nicer things for yourself, that's really when it hit me the impact of having a repossession. Um, so from that experience, I was motivated to clean my credit up. So I hire a um, agency that's really helping me to challenge some things on my credit report. And I'm actually um, happy to report they were able to get the repossession removed. Okay. Um, from all three of my credit reports, um, it was going to fall off this August, but Toyota basically was like, okay, you know, we'll take it off. Um, but it was only recently, I say that to say that I really understood the gravity because I didn't have enough money for the car being repossessed to even matter. Now that I'm in a position where like, oh, it will be nice to have a nicer car. Now it, now it matters to me that like, I couldn't get one if I wanted one. Yeah. And so you went from, you know, car being repossessed, you know, I think you said undergrad for six years, divorced, single mom, and now having a car that you, you know, a BMW that you enjoy, what does that mean to you? And when you kind of think about, man. It means a lot. And I would say it means a lot for me. Um, not so much the car, but like the, the, the luxury of like not worrying. Um, the luxury of not worrying, like peace that surpasses understanding, we don't realize how much of like a luxury that really is and how much financial health helps that. Like right now, if an emergency happened, I know I would be okay. Like if I needed to take my child to the emergency room, I know that it's a vehicle outside, right? Versus, you know, six years ago when my child got sick, like I, I j he just was sick and I had to you know, like call a couple of friends and see who was up in the middle of the night and who would take me. But like the shame of that, the guilt of that, right? Like having more financial freedom and having like, you know, a nicer car, duh, I have to admit it gives me confidence in myself, like not only as a woman, but as a professional as well as, you know, as a mother. What would you tell a mom right now that might be going through a similar situation? Like you had to get you a good step daddy girl no i mean <laughs> no i say that you know i say that jokingly but all you know for real for real um 
when my husband knew, oh my God, when I was in the paycheck system and I couldn't get a bank account because it was that bad, like my husband was like, I'll, you know, we were dating, like I'll open you an account, you know, when I couldn't get a nicer car because of my, my husband got my first BMW because he's like, I want you to have these things. And like, I know that you're worthy of these things. And like, you went through a bad divorce and it happens, you know? And so I will certainly say getting you a partner who sees value in you, even when you don't get heavy. Yes, girl, that's a major key. But also recognizing that there, it will get better, right? Like today or tomorrow, like God forbid, if something was safe with my husband, I feel totally confident that I would absolutely be prepared. But beyond that, having um, confidence in yourself is, is going to make the difference in where you are today and five years from now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, obviously five years from now when we talk about the future. I think I heard you mention before five to nine. So what made five you, to nine. Yep. So what what made you want to to open that? What made you want to start um that? My company's name is Rebrand Career Consulting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started my um company, and when I first started my company, I didn't really understand like Texas. I didn't really understand um, right off. I didn't understand any of that until I sat down with a really good accountant and she started asking me, right, like, where do you donate your money? What do you do with your money? Um, where where are the places where you put money pre-tax, right, when you pay yourself? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. It comes. I spend, you know, like I pay my staff or whatever. And that was the first time she said, well, do you contribute anything to your children's 529 accounts? And I'm like, they're what? Um, And she let me know that there were savings accounts that I could start for my children. And I could put a a certain amount there um, as a pre-tax deduction. And whether it was from my business or whether it was from like my personal accounts from my job, and it would, you know, essentially not be it would be income that I would not have to necessarily pay taxes on, um, but would benefit my children. And she also let me know that the regulations had changed recently and that those funds could be used for private school as well. So I didn't have to wait until my children um, got to the college age to utilize those resources. And what does it mean to you to, to give your children a head start? Oh my gosh, it means everything. Um, And it means everything because like I said, my mom was a teenager when she had me and she certainly knew like, yeah, sure, go to college. But I remember getting to college and there was like no money, right? Like you, like I got driven there and like, here's your dorm room, but there was no bank account if everybody was ordering or there was no like car, like there was, I just barely got to school. And so I think that when I think of what I want my children to have, I don't want them to just get somewhere and not have. I want my children to be able to have an account where I'm not still struggling when they're in college. And there is an account where if they need clothes for college or they want to go on a spring break trip, like there's funds for that. And it's not in the form of a refund check because child the way I spent up those refund checks it's like embarrassing um but you know the the reality is that like I didn't know and it wasn't no extra money and then once I had my son at 20 I became an independent and so I could get all the funds available um specific to me and so being able to give my children a head start without them needing the the loans it, it means tons um, because I recognize that like, when you know better, you do better. I certainly believe if my mom knew better, it's not even about her having the money. If, if she could, if she knew that I needed it and she could find a job to do it, she absolutely would have did it. She really just didn't know like, oh, okay. When you get there, getting you to college ain't to be all end all. Like you're going to need spending money while you're there. You're going to want to, I don't know what, like, I think my mom just forgot that. Like I had to get my hair done. I had to get my notes, just normal stuff that um, 18 and 19 year olds want to do. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, right? The era that we're living in now is that like people are starting to realize that like, okay, certain things need to be taught to our children and certain things just, you know, we have to have the conversation. Um, so what, like, what's your opinions on the overall age um, that like a parent should talk to their children about finance? Do you, do you have a, all right, by the time they're a teenager or, by the time they start filling out college application letters, do you have a, 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 a thought process behind that? So, okay, when I think finances, first of all, I want to be transparent that like I'm still learning, of course, right? Yeah, of course, of course. Like, 
like I'm, I don't do everything right. Um, and so I try to share with my son the things that I'm learning, but some of the things that we do, my, my oldest is 10 and then my twins just turned five. So there's certainly like a gap. Um, but some of the conversations that I've begun to have with my son now that he's 10 is um, just surrounding like the potential of how much money he could make, right? So he knows what his allowance is every week. And then I live in the Northeastern area. We just had snowstorms. And so I let him know, like, if you go and shovel these many houses and you, you know, he ain't the best shoveler. So, you know, if you're getting, (laughs) right, you know, if you're getting $10, you know, from even just these four neighbors, that's $40 plus your allowance. Um, This is what you made this week, right? So we have those conversations, you know, our neighbors have dogs. So like he'll dog walk or like pick up poop, you know, little things like that. So I certainly try to like instill the value of like potential of money, because I think that was a huge barrier for me, right? Like I couldn't see myself earning six figures. Like it just, I couldn't even understand like, well, what am I going to do that's going to bring me that much money? I didn't even see myself as an entrepreneur. Honestly, I just saw myself as like hustling to get a goal. Like, oh, okay, I got the passports, cool. Oh, I booked the trip, cool. Um, versus, hey, here's this way to make continuous income and to have a plan. So I talked to my son about like planning surrounding the weather and planning surrounding like the, you know, filling the needs of someone else. Um, So he takes the trash out for neighbors for trash day. But the conversation that we've really been leaning on lately has been why I keep $5 from his allowance every week. Like that's a big deal to him. He'd be like, run me my money. Like I'm sure. And every week I try to explain to him that like this $5 is going into your savings because, um, and not his real savings, like a portion of my check goes into his real savings, but this savings is specific to birthdays for family, um, like Mother's Day, Father's Day, because I believe that that's very important um, to give gifts to your loved ones or to have something available, even if it's not like a physical gift, but like, hey, I'm going to take my dad out for coffee for Father's Day, or hey, I'm going to take my mom out for Mother's Day for coffee. So right now I try to instill in him the value of putting away money first for something upcoming, um, because that's the biggest barrier for me. My biggest barrier was like, oh, I got to pay bills again. Like I never was putting the money aside appropriately. So it always felt like, dang, I just paid, you know, rent or dang, I just paid my light bill because I wasn't putting that money away first whenever I got paid. So since that's how, you know, my husband and I, you know, my husband takes care of most of the bills, but you know, my kids get paid first. When I get paid, there's a direct transfer into their accounts. They get paid first. And then whatever else I might need, like my subscriptions get paid. And then whatever's left is like what I play around with. But I've really been trying to instill in my son the value of like, whatever you got to save or whatever you got to pay, take that out first. Yeah. And, and, and I know you, you hear so often, you know, pay yourself first. Right. Before you pay anyone else, make sure because it's because if you don't pay yourself first, who will. Right. If you don't take care of yourself, no one is going to, you know, say knock on the door and say, all right, here's your money. Right. So you really have to take care of yourself. But I definitely appreciate your transparency um, in terms of not knowing everything. And I think that's a huge part of of the puzzle, too. Right. It's just like I think there's a lot of people feel like, all right, well, I don't know. Everything means that you can't talk to your children or your friends or whatever about it. I think having the conversation, you know, as black people. Right. Is is extremely important as well. You don't have to be an expert to just simply talk about things. There's a lot of things that we may not be experts on, but we still find a way to be opinionated on it. But I think finance is is an additional thing as well um, that should be talked about at least. Um, So talk to me too, right, about your business, right? Um, What, you know, I know you mentioned before um, how you were doing it in the beginning um, and you made that transition, but just give us um, a little bit more um, background on it, what it is that you do specifically um, and things like that. Yeah, so I own Rebrand Career Consulting. Um, We're a premium professional development firm supporting Black and Brown women on their academic career and salary goals. Um, We do that by providing both tangible documents, so admission statements, resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn enhancements, um, federal resumes, et cetera, as well as consultation services, so mock interviews, career discovery, um, and pretty much anything in between, you know, like supporting Black women in understanding salary negotiations, supporting Black women and understanding like higher education options related to graduate school. Um, So yeah, I got started again, like I said, I got started 
because I kind of was just helping people on the side. Um, and then it kind of like blew up as I started to talk about it on social media or other people were talking about the work that I was doing on social media. And originally, oh my goodness, I didn't even have the capital to like start a website, right? So when I wanted to start a website, I bartered with another Black woman. She was a web designer. She reached out to me to do her resume. And I was like, oh, a website. I should probably get one of these. So I reached out to her and I was just like, hey, so, you know, I want to get my website built, you know, can you help me with where I get started? And she sent me an inquiry form. Long story short, we ended up agreeing to barter and she did my first website um, and it worked. It was great. And then I started to feel like this website is not meeting my needs um, just because I wanted to be able to offer e-commerce services. Um, and then she built my second website. We offer e-commerce service that also allowed us to expand to um, provide services to the global market. So we've helped clients as far as Amsterdam. Um, and honestly, it's so funny that like, I didn't start my business as a business. I started my business as a hustle um, to meet goals because I never even saw myself as an entrepreneur. To this day, I love having a nine to five. I love my job. I've never not had a job. Like I love working somewhere else. Um, and any entrepreneur who says like they started a business because they don't like working for people, I'm I'm questionable because when you have when you're an entrepreneur you're you got like 35 clients like all you know 35 bosses I mean right like I can report to one person but reporting to 35 people is is a lot more stressful and gives me anxiety so um, I kind of even though my business has like risen to have like 29,000 followers on you know Twitter and all these followers on Instagram. I will say that people buy into my business because I show up as myself. You know, I show up as someone who didn't come from a lot of money. I show up as someone who has to rewrite my own resume sometimes. I show up as someone who still gets nervous for interviews. And I show up as a parent who parented through the pandemic and worked from home and was interviewing from job for jobs during that same thing. And so um, I don't have a real marketing plan for my business. I honestly just every day show up as myself. I mean, you're, you're a human being and I definitely like that. You know, I have a, a marketing plan. I show up as myself. You know, that, that, that's, that's real. I mean, you can't really put on the front and things like that. It's, you know, it's who you are. Um, but when we talk about, you know, professional development, do you think it's okay for people to, um, you know, of course not, you know, giving up all the sauce, if you will, but do you think it's okay for people to like, accept the first offer or how do you how do you think a lot of people in general might feel about receiving an offer that they may not like especially especially too considering we're in the middle of a pandemic yeah so for starters before you jump into any salary negotiation you have to know what you need um so i remember a time when i was making thirty two thousand dollars, and so somebody offered me forty thousand, and i was like yes Girl, 40000 still was not enough. Like, you know, but for me, it was more money than I had. So I was like, cool, 40000 And I still was feeling check to check. It wasn't until I got to 65000 where I was like, okay, like, I'm feeling a little something. But the reality is that if I would have negotiated, negotiated that first offer, I probably could have gotten at least fifty. You know what I mean? Like I just took, oh, 40,000 pool is more than I had. So I may accept it. Whereas I could have got a lot closer to where I needed to be and close a lot of gaps just by adding up my expenses for the year. So really just going in Excel and, you know, writing out what's my rent, what's my car insurance, what's daycare, like writing out all those things. That way, when somebody gives you a number, you feel a lot more confident challenging their number because you know, oh girl, this ain't it. You know what I mean? If, if I added up all my bills and my bills were $54,000 for the year, it's no way somebody could have came to me with 40,000. And I said, absolutely. Yeah. By knowing what you need, when someone brings you a number that's less than what you really want, you have enough confidence to say, wow, while I really want to work for this organization, um, when I consider all of my needs for myself and my family, unfortunately, um, this offer isn't in line with what I need. Is there a way that we can get closer to X number and make sure that that number is even 10 to 12,000 more than what you actually need? That way, when they negotiate with either they're going to say yes, or they're going to walk you back maybe $5,000, but you're still over or at least at what you need for the year. Hmm. And that's a good way to think it, think about it, right? Is, you know, thinking backwards, right? Instead of just asking, all right, what do I want? Think about what, what, what do you need, right? What is it that, 
you know what I'm saying? What are your bills? What are things that you need to cover? Make sure that you're on, on top of. Um, but I, I, I think too, though, right? Like you hit on it before the idea of having a nine to five as well as your own business. Um, yeah. So what, what do you think the pros are of having both? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? What, what do you think the pros are of having both, right? A nine to five oh as goodness. well as your own business? There's so many pros. <laughs> There's so many pros, you know, and I say this as a person who, like I said, I come from a working family. My husband still works like, you know, I'm still in my doctoral program. First of all, like the tuition benefits. Let's start there. Um, I pretty much always had an employer that helped pay for my tuition. Um, certainly the professional development, like I find myself growing as an entrepreneur, the more that I learn in my actual um, nine to five role, I get access to so many trainings on like court, whether it's corporate communication, whether it's marketing, like I have so many resources at my disposal as an entrepreneur, um, as well as someone who has a nine to five. And then I will also say health insurance, like it's very, very ghetto to pay for your own health insurance. I'm very lucky that not only does my employer pay for my health insurance, my employer pays for my family's health insurance. And so that's cutting about 1500 out of um, my monthly costs or at least my quarterly costs. So that's something else I wanna add. When you think about compensation and salary, it's not just how much they're paying you. It's also like, what are the other financial benefits? So for me, my employer paying for my health insurance for my whole family is huge. Like that's so expensive. Not only do they do that, they help with tuition. There's like, you know, I work from home even without the pandemic, I'll always work from home. Like I'm never putting miles on my car. I'm never paying for tires. Those things are super, super valuable. So consider those in your compensation also. Um, but honestly, I would say having a nine to five gives me a lot more structure in my life than having a business doesn't. Like having a business can be chaotic. Like you could be good one day and dragged on Twitter the next. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you could have a $2,000 day and then the next day you got chargebacks. Like it's so much, honestly. And let's talk about taxes, okay? Like last year I was $60,000. Everybody wanna talk about, oh, I made a quarter million dollars. How much did you pay in taxes? Okay, like nobody told me about that. And so I honestly think that like, oh, in the IRS, it's not really fun. It's very ghetto, right? Like you can't really be balling out of control when you older. Like it's just, it's overwhelming. You know what I mean? Um. But I would say that being an entrepreneur provides me the, the freedom to, if I wanted to, last year, we just decided suddenly we were going to take my son to the Dominican Republic for, you know, he turned 10. We're like, wow, 10's a big deal. We've been in the house the whole time. And we were able to go to a very nice resort with you know, our three children, my husband, not like, it just provides financial freedom that like, I know my bills are good. Entrepreneurship allows me to like do some other fun mm -hmm. stuff um, that I just feel like my my check would allow me to do, but I have to wait two weeks. You know what I'm saying? Right, and I'm right, like, right. but I want it today. Yeah, right, facts. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's funny you bring up the IRS and taxes. It's like we're about to be entering tax season as, as of this recording. Everybody is rich until it's tax time. Like <laughs> everybody, everybody's making money until you know it's time to like really, really you know pay Uncle Sam. Um, but I asked that question, though, because I, I just think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, job shaming nowadays with people saying, like, you know, I can never work a job, but there's benefits, right? There's, and I don't yeah. just mean like insurance, just like in life in general, like, you know, it's okay to be employed, right? Like, it's, I promise you, especially now when we're dealing with um, job uncertainty. Um, but in order to get a job, obviously, you know, you, you know, you have to deal with, you know, a resume and just overall preparation for cover letters. Um, so do you think uh, 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 the perfect resume exists? Hmm. I mean, if you work with me, but ah, I mean, okay, talk um, to talk. I ain't mad at it. I ain't mad at it. Sure. I think that one thing that I have talked about in the HR world specifically is that it's okay to hire an applicant with the skills gap. Honestly, the most job jumping I've done is when I wasn't learning. When I was 100% qualified, when I was darn near overqualified, when I could do every single thing on the list, within like three months, I was bored. I felt like I could do this in my sleep. And once you feel like I could do this in my sleep, suddenly you start feeling like underpaid. Like, I, what? Like, this is cake. Like, y'all not... It, it start, I started to resent my job almost because I took a job where I checked all the boxes 
Um, and so I wasn't growing anymore. Um, and while there are certainly times in your life, let me also say where like, if you are going through something at work yet, yeah, I mean, in your personal life, yes, take an easy job that you would do in your sleep because you got other stuff going on. But for me, I didn't have anything else going on. I really liked my job. I was, you know, at the height of my career, like really just getting started. And I just felt like my job wasn't giving me any skills. So they were trying to keep me stuck. What I realized is that for me to grow, I needed to be in a role where maybe I didn't check all the boxes, but I was able to show in an interview how I was going to close that skills gap and how I was going to continue to grow with the company. The benefit from an HR perspective is somebody who checks all the boxes, you know, maybe they're just taking this position to make their resume a little more robust, but someone who maybe doesn't meet all the boxes, maybe they have a skills gap. That's someone, you know, is going to grow with the company because you're going to be able to add to their professional development. Yeah. And so I think that's a good point too, right? It's like you kind of cater it right based off the company's needs, as opposed to just what it is that you want. Um, so do you think it's important? Like, is there a balance if you will, between like when you're talking about, listing out your skills versus what the company wants? Is, is that like a, a kind of ongoing battle? Um, you definitely want to make sure that the skills that you're listing are the skills that they want, right? That's first of all, um, like as many as possible, right? But it's certainly nothing wrong if you can identify another gap that you could close for the company, right? So, um, let me find a good example. Say you're really good at, um, oh, I'll even use myself, right? Like, so I do DEI for a global tech company. And something that we were missing was just employee resource groups. Like they had a lot of other things going on. They had all these things they wanted me to do, but like employee resource groups weren't in my job description. But did I know as a DEI practitioner, like, hey, if we want to talk about inclusion, people need space where they can show up fully as themselves. So, you know, um, something that I look to do if I were a candidate, what would be to start or expand any employee resource groups that you already have. So it's certainly nothing wrong with looking at a job description, checking off as many boxes as possible, but also showing what you can bring that maybe is missing in the job description. Mm, 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 mm. And that, I think that's really important too, because even though it might seem obvious, like, all right, you know, this is a job I'm applying for, at the same time, it, it shouldn't just be, you know, in my opinion, a paper where you're just talking so much about yourself without acknowledging what, you know, the, the employer wants. Um, so even in, in talking about um, cover letters too, right? Do you, I know some, obviously some require it, some don't. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on cover letters? Not necessarily just the pros and cons or benefits, but just like, you think they should exist? Love cover letters. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, love I love cover letters. Wow. I've always loved cover letters. Um, even when I was in HR, I always read cover letters and I had colleagues who were honest, like, uh, I don't really care to read it. You know what I mean? Wow. Um, but what I find is that cover letters offer an opportunity for you to A, showcase your writing skills. Like if this is going to be a position that's requiring you to write or that's going to expect writing materials or deliverables deliverables from you, your cover letter is an excellent way to pretty much submit a writing sample without saying I'm submitting a writing sample. Right. Um, that's certainly relevant in certain fields, like whether it's a technical writing role or it's a role um, in human resources and communications, definitely. Um, but I also recognize there's some fields that it's not necessary, right? Like I have some clients who are in IT and their IT is not technical writing or really like communication outward. It really is like help desk or like like building machines and for that no it's not necessary to have a cover letter I have an engineer client I was like here's your money big like you don't need a um cover letter but I would say that generally if you don't need a cover letter you need a portfolio to showcase mm. do you think um that the resume as well as a cover letter is really the, the difference maker in, in terms of someone getting a job versus not getting a job Absolutely not. I think that nepotism is a huge issue when we talk about the difference between someone getting a role and not getting a role. I remind myself of that. I also remind my clients of that, that oftentimes a role is being posted simply because they have to post it, because they have to say that, oh, we posted it, we found an internal candidate, blah, 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 blah. Um, whether that is an internal referral, or that is an internal promotion, or that is an internal transfer, or that's somebody hooking somebody up. Um, the reality is that 
nepotism is a far greater reason why qualified folks, especially qualified Black folks, aren't getting certain roles, um, which is why I do what I do, right? Like, I certainly use my connections for my clients. I certainly encourage my clients to reach directly out to hiring managers, find out what college they went to, find out if y'all have any sort of LinkedIn connections, find out if they're a part of a sorority, if they're a part of a professional network that you know of. But because of those things, that's why it's also important to utilize your own professional network, whether it's a um, young professional accountants or young black network of attorneys, like whatever that looks like for you, for you to also cash in on the nepotism that's available so that someone can personally take your resume or your cover letter and hand it in. Certainly having a good resume or cover letter matters, but we've all seen mediocre um, people have certain positions and you're like, how did you do that? And the reality is that they knew someone. So it didn't matter what their resume looked like. Mm. That is real. Um, and just the power of not just networking, but just the idea of like, you know, being like, you can have the greatest resume in the world, but sometimes it just won't work out. Uh, but yeah. obviously, you know, you can control what you control. Right. Yeah. Um, so do you think that there's like a, um, a, a time frame when people should update it? Right. Like, should it be like once a year when you're when you're should you wait five years until you get ready to apply for another job or should it be? be okay. So certainly don't wait until you need a new job. Right. Um, I generally advise to like try to update your resume every six months, like just every six months. Go through like what have I learned? What have I achieved at work? What projects have I worked on at work? Um, what new certification? have I taken it also will give you an opportunity to look at your resume and see like am I really growing in my role because if I don't have anything to add no new projects like my account portfolio hasn't expanded I haven't sold more cars like whatever it is if it hasn't grown in six months that's really an opportunity for you to begin to look into some professional development because you got to have something changing within the next six months whether that's hey you know what I took a course I've had moments where I was like you know, I've at the role where I wasn't growing, I'm like, dang, you ain't do nothing new in six months. Mm. And I had to check myself. So I took an Excel class um, and learned, you know, advanced Excel. And I can say that it really helps me as a DEI practitioner in a corporate world, because I do a lot of data evaluation and like manipulation to present data in a way in which is clear to other people who may not be looking at the raw data of 5,000 people. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, damn, that's, a, that's impressive. I, I think though too, um, what would you say is something that should not go on a resume? That might be like either be common or, you know, some that's like, yeah, we, we should probably stay off this for now in terms of, all right, this, 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 either this sentence or this category, like, I don't know, um, objective. Right. So if and, it, and this isn't an example or I, I don't know, I, I would hope, but <laughs> this is just an example of, you know, um, all right, here's why I'm applying. This is at the top of the resume. Is there anything that you feel just stay away from? Yeah. So I'm going to go with references available upon request. Because like, girl, yes, we know, like, I know that references are available because like, you know what I mean? Like, well, it's, I you, yeah. it's like a silly thing to add. Um, References are available upon request. And then I also say like your hobbies, like your hobbies, like oh. tennis or like, like if you're not going yeah, you're not. to be like a gym teacher or like a yoga instructor or like, you know, like a recreational developer, you know, like, okay. Um, I'd say hobbies like hiking, like yeah. we don't like we want to see your personality when you get here but like you're using valuable space that you could use to like showcase maybe a special class that you took or maybe a certification that you took um so don't use like priceless landscape on your resume on like things that aren't necessarily um super valuable and they don't really add to your professionalism yeah and it's almost like you know you're not going on a date you know it's like obviously it's important for people to know you but you know Right, like badminton. Like, girl, you're the <laughs> yeah. badminton champion? Like, all right, finance director. Because, like, right. what you think? Yeah. And so, too, so if the year is 2022, right, what do you think is the oldest some uh, an item should be on the resume? If, like, is it past, you know, four years? Definitely years? past four years. Um, yeah. I'd say I usually go um, 10 to 12 years. Okay. Um, and then 
I'd also caveat that with, um, I'm an, I'm a doctoral student. And so when I apply for adjunct roles, my CV expands pretty much everything I've ever done because they care. Right. And then the other caveat is government employment. So any federal resume should have your entire work history ever, just because it's a federal resume. Um, so that's like the significant difference, but we usually say 10 years, 10 years, because one, you don't want to have like a six page resume, but also two, you don't want to date yourself so much that you kind of begin to we wiggle into like um ageism concerns mm, 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 mm. ah yeah that's a good point too and and i and i accept because obviously you know it's an interesting um dynamic to me it's cool to hear you say what 10 to 12 years um in terms of the gap um but so just kind of i guess thinking on that too obviously you know with resume um as well as cover letters um what would you say and this is the last you know resume question i have i promise um what's like three beginner tips you would have for someone um, looking to create a resume or looking to update a resume? Well, first of all, book me at rebrandcc.com. Um, and if that is not an option, um, even though I have templates available that will help you with your resume and cover letter and I could also do that for you. Um, I would certainly say to know the way in which you have transferable skills. And so it's less relevant what you did at your old role and far more relevant to understand how that translates into what your new employer wants to see, right? So like we all respond to emails at work. We all answer phone calls. However, unless you're applying to be like a receptionist, an administrative professional, nobody cares that you responded to emails, right? Like if you're trying to be an accountant, you answering phones and responding to emails is really not that relevant, right? You explaining complex text terms and forms to clients by email and phone is far more relevant, right? Um, so recognizing the transferable skills as well as um, I would say making sure that you're using um, the correct tense. So if it's your current job, making sure that it's in present tense. If it's your past job, making sure that it's in past tense, as well as just making sure that it is very clear the achievements that you've had at different roles, not just your responsibilities, but like, what do people applaud you for? What are you good at? What did you decrease? What did you increase? What did you improve? What did you develop? Really making sure that you showcase yourself um, in a format that's focused on your achievements. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. I appreciate that. Um, and so, you know, to kind of, you know, think about your entire story, you know, going back to, um, you know, car being repossessed, um, you know, earlier being a single mom, six years with undergrad, um, and to now living a, a life of abundance and really, you know, being um, a role model for not just your clients, but your family as a, as a whole. Um, and that leads me, right, to my final question that I have for you. And it's a question that I ask everyone that's been on the show. Um, how do you want to be remembered? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, I want to be remembered as someone who cares because I think there's a lot of people doing the work, but not enough people who care about the work, right? Like resume writing is certainly a lucrative business, right? Like I would be lying if I said it wasn't, but um, it's something to say about the fact that I care about my clients. I care about their children. Um, I care about their experiences. I care about them as Black people. I connect to them as Black people. I understand addiction. I understand mental illness. Um, I understand not having. And so because I'm someone who cares, I think that's what I want people to remember, that even my children, when I yell, oh, my mom's yelling, like, yes, my mom did not play, but my mom cares. Um, my mom didn't play about reading, you know, because she cared. Um, with my husband when I'm up late on a computer, right? Like, I hope he knows it's because like my wife cares. My wife cares that we are debt free. My wife cares that um, other women are um, reaching their career milestones. My wife cares that our children have savings accounts. Um, even my parents, like my parents, they know that I'm doing the things that I'm doing right now, even for them, because I care. Um, being a person who cares, I think is significant because we can all start a business and run it up a bag and spend money and buy Chanel and buy Louis V this and Louis V that. But like, how do you care for other people after you bought your bag, after you um, 
bought your son a bed after you did all these things how did you show that you cared for those that mattered and even for those who may not be directly impacted by your light, but those who just need a helping hand? Mm, mm. That, that is extremely, extremely real. You know, the idea of just helping people, you know, in a way, you know, obviously defining your own legacy, you know, being someone, uh, you know, a person of value because, you know, this is really, really important. Um, so if you could, all right, just drop all of your social media where people can find you, drop your website, um, you know, if you have a course, drop that. Um, any and everywhere where people can find you, um, your next project you got going out, whatever the case may be, run, run, uh, run wild with the promo. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have any courses. I keep seeing everybody is selling a course. Like, I don't have maybe any. It's, maybe it's you know, maybe it's time. Who knows? No, I don't have any. <laughs> you know what I mean, like. I don't really have it in me like that. You know, I take on, I really feel my lane in entrepreneurship is just writing a resume. That's it. It ain't marketing. It ain't nothing. It ain't course content. It's just the resume. So if anyone is interested in any sort of professional development support, feel free to check out www.rebrandcc.com. I can be found on Twitter, bossy underscore bread. I'm also bossy underscore Brit on Instagram. Um, you can also check out my business at rebrand.career.consulting on Instagram. Um, I'm doing a lot better with content, but I'm really focusing my content this year on making sure that um, Black women feel affirmed in their professional journeys because imposter syndrome is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is. It is. It is. Especially nowadays, like I said, with this, with this whole pandemic going on and everyone, you know, the, the idea with social media as well, you know, having people compare themselves to one another, it's, it's a real thing. Um, so one, you know, obviously, thank you, you know, for being on the show. Um, are there any final words that you have for our audience? Yeah, like you could reinvent yourself, right? Like I know we always laugh about Drea, right? Like Drea's, your wholeness could get deleted, right? Like everybody thought it was so funny, but um, the reality is it can. Like you could just start over whatever it was that you were or you felt you didn't have or you felt you couldn't do. You literally can decide today or tomorrow, like, you know what? I'm off it. Like I'm onto something better. I'm onto something new. Um, and that's okay. I think that's the, the greatest word that I never heard growing up is that like tomorrow is a new day. Like I remember so funny I would get in trouble I'll be on punishment for like two weeks right like oh my goodness and then my mom would still remind me but the reality is that um the harm in that is we never learn that we could forgive ourselves and start over tomorrow so I just want anyone and everyone to know that like you could start over whenever you're ready to mm, yeah that's real you know you can always start over it, it's okay life is life I think is life is longer than people really realize you know we always say life is short but life is more unexpected than anything you know so um, thank you again for being on the show. Um, just like that on the fine legacy front, y'all make sure you follow on Instagram, Twitter, um, TikTok, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, check out the store um, in the link of the description. All right. And just like that, y'all be gone. Peace.